Here we are, episode 858 of the Wrestling Israel podcast, recapping tonight, AEW's Forbidden Door 2024 in New Jersey, and hell of a night. Listen, I'll tell you this, when it comes to AEW, one of the things I really do appreciate about what they're doing with their brand is basically what Ring of Honor was doing before Sinclair really screwed things up. You know, when you think about the Ring of Honor, I think about the Ring of Honor Supercard, the F1 Supercard back in 2019, when I said, you know, everything was starting to make its way and that WWE had to go and worry about a formidable force, which would end up becoming what AEW is now. And I'm not saying that, you know, AEW is coming on the come up and they're going to go ahead and just take over. No, nothing like that. And actually, in the last five years, a lot of things have changed. But what I can say is that there's some real good coming now in the last couple of years of Forbidden Door coming into existence because of the fact that we have this show now and by bringing it here, they really brought themselves up to the point where when they first did this episode, the show overall in Chicago, United center, one of the things you can think about was that the level of AEW stars that they had put into the pay-per-views with conjunction with new Japan for wrestling, that includes stardom ring of honor wrestling. Wasn't necessarily a part of all this yet, but it kind of was, but the thing was, there was a lot of changes that were going on in this event in the last couple of years. And it's a good thing. Okay. Because of the fact that what AEW has done with their, their startup, their star power is they do have wrestlers now that are very well, acclaimed and they're not just coming across from you know various you know independents that might be not that well known i mean the fact of the matter is that we have some of these stars that constantly get put over here that are wrestling from other promotions that have come in under contract to aw so the camaraderie of the fact that new japan has had some of these stars work overseas or some of these stars working in mexico that's the real factor that comes in for AEW because their stars are getting world acclaim without having to do the global tour that WWE does because it is within that in other organizations there are said familiar companies with Japan and Mexico that people are familiar with now it's not AAA so much anymore it's CMLL but then again, AAA is also going to their own market, so they're not necessarily working with anybody right now. Not even so much with, I mean, they're doing still some stuff with MLW, but not with anybody else, really. But that's their own story. So what we're looking at right now, Stardom, Ring of Honor, and New Japan Pro Wrestling, and CMLL, which is the secondary league in Mexico behind AAA, but still very prominent. We're seeing all these stars coming together into these promotions, which is really great. And now the roster that AEW has, we don't necessarily have a relationship with these groups where they're not necessarily not well known to each other because now it's been obvious that the relationship has happened where Orange Cassidy or, you know, Will Ospreay or John Moxley or Mercedes Monet. You have all these stars that have worked in multiple organizations under the AEW banner. And what does this lead up to? Well, they made a point to say it on the pay-per-view tonight. In January of 2025, New Japan Pro Wrestling now will present a two-night event, Wrestle Kingdom and Wrestle Dynasty. And they will include stars from AEW, Ring of Honor, Stardom, and CMLL. So New Japan has fostered the relationship. WWE doesn't really want to go ahead and play with other organizations. I mean, NWA's done it right now. They've done World as a Vampire. They worked in New Mexico for a while and have done some things there as well. And, you know, with some of these stars working in other organizations, AEW is creating what I feel like is another territory system. It's the only thing you could really do to combat WWE. In one way, in the second way is you have to create some sports entertainment of your own. And I think they do some things right now with their 
product that they're kind of getting that route. And we got some of that tonight as well with Timeless Tony Storm, with the setup of Chris Jericho in the featured match and his team with Learning Tree going against Samojo Hook and Kasuyoshi Shibata. All of that enclosed, right? Even though it's a little bit, a bit of a, a hang up for AEW to kind of try to put this together and bring all these stars into the play, into storylines that we're going to have to set up for Forbidden Door. And I will say that, you know, when they did hit that 502,000 audience mark last week on Dynamite, that, among other things, probably doesn't help much in the run for them. Even last year, if you look at the ratings, that Forbidden Door around this time also took a little bit of their hit. Like, if you really look at the ratings of what they did, now I'm not going to make an excuse of the fact that they struggled last year or they struggled with the ratings on that one week and came back somewhat. But still, if we even go and look back at the numbers last year, I can tell you that Dynamite did have a bit of a struggle off of that. Because remember, when you look in June of last year, okay, when they were pulling, let's say, Coming out of Revolution, you know, you would get in 2023, you did see ratings where they, it was the last time they hit a million viewers, okay? And they would get close to that again in March 20 or March 22nd or so of 2023. But then, like I said, got into the 800,000 mark, got into the 700,000 mark, and that was that in between part where they were kind of in a struggle. They were just trying to build things back up. But again, even going into the weekend, into Forbidden Door, 800 to 900,000, they were kind of there in that spot. And when they set it up two years ago and put that together for Forbidden Door, again, it was still an issue where the ratings might have had a little bit of a hit to it. And it did, at my point exactly. So when in 2022, Dynamite was pulling sometimes near a million viewers. There was the point that led up to Forbidden Door where they pulled on the week of June 13th to 17th, they pulled 761,000 and then they pulled 878,000 June 20th to 24th. But then the week after they had a million viewers and then went, rolled back up again. But in June, they take a little bit of a dent in the TV side because of this, because the TV audience is not going to be, they're not going to have the, the familiarity of some of their other storylines because of the incorporation of different stars being brought in. So when they decide to go and do these other names in here, you know, Echicero, nobody knows who he is, but he's facing MTF. Then, you know, there's not much, much of a storyline unless you've been paying the new Japan, paying attention to new Japan about John Moxley being NWG and new Japan for wrestling champion winning in Chicago back in what was in October. I think it was. And then he drops the belt to Tetsuya Naito tonight. And then we don't know the, all the story about when it comes to Will Nightingale and Mercedes Monet facing each other back in, in New Japan for the strong open weight title, right? Or the whole story behind Stardom with Mariah May and Mina Shirakawa. Like all those things we don't, we're not necessarily all familiar with, right? And then we had some other matches that got brought in that, you know, Brian Danielson, Shingo Takagi. I mean, it's a men's own heart cup tournament match. You make the importance of that. And Brian Danielson's trek to overcome some of the adversity he's had right now and come out strong because he's trying to make this his final year or so of wrestling. He wants to really try to finish strong. Saber Jr. Orange Cassidy. We don't know the whole backstory. You might not know the whole backstory unless you pay attention to what was going on over in New Japan. And then some of the stars being part of the ladder match for the TNT title. When it comes to El Fantasma, you might not see him much of, or you didn't know much of Leo Rush unless you see him on collision. Things like that. There's a little bit of that, okay, all these other players coming into the play, and you have to somehow incorporate some of these stars in. And I think they did a really good job of that tonight. So this is not your run-of-the-mill pay-per-view for Forbidden Door where they're going to have some kind of, it's like a more of a long-term setup. Because of all these relationships they're making. And that's the most important thing. I mean, including the fact that a lot of their own stars are working in other organizations and get a chance to be part of it. And to promote said event, you saw some of these stars enter into various territories and make a point of it. 
So Mercedes Monet went and confronted Stephanie Vacare and CMLL. Then you have Chris Jericho confronting at another event. And the same thing goes. It's like all these things that are all happening here. That might not be everybody's cup of tea because it's not something we normally follow in storyline on television. But we're going to see some things that are going to probably change things up. Britt Baker has now returned and she comes out and is seen by Mercedes Monet after the match is done. After Mercedes Monet wins title and both titles, the New Japan Strong Openweight title and the TBS Championship. So now she has both and Britt Baker now confronts her. So we're going to have that coming up for Dynamite. Then you have Daniel Garcia and MJF looking on on as MJF, well, excuse me, as Soros Strickland and Will Ospreay go almost 30 minutes to a barn burner of a match for the main event. I was wondering if they were really going to do too much, do so much to really build up to that match and build it to where it was. Great amount of false finishes. This was excitement personified. What a hell of a main event. Really, really fun match. And I actually think that the fact that the, the Cia Naito John Moxley match went 17 minutes. I don't, you, they could have gone longer. He even set the point at 60 minute time limit. They could have gone longer for the title match, but they finished it up. And I think obviously there's a whole lot more you could have brought into that match for Naito and Moxley, but they need to leave something because that main event had to have the time, plus the main event had to have the luster. It had to be the match that was going to like overshadow as much as it could the rest of the night. Like you're, you're going to end the night with the most, one of the most prominent significant matches, but you had some great matches in between a lot of trios matches tonight, that ladder match for the vacant AD, AEW TNT championship. They make a point of commentary that, you know, first of all, Jack Perry was going to be inheriting it. Now he earns it in a hell of a match to Keshta taking a great shot on a, uh, was it a phantasma? I think it was to both tables. That was wonderful. Mark Briscoe just, I feel like he's Sabu out there. Like I could just throw chairs at tables and just kind of like maneuver along. That guy's just a, a hardcore masterclass when it comes to him. He just, he really is feels like that to me. Monet Vecare, that was a great match to put together. I thought they did a really good job. And some of these matches for some of these stars that we might not be familiar with, with Vecare, you know, did quite a bit to try to move things forward and try to go ahead and get Monet in positions where in submissions, especially where Monet was trying to go ahead and he was going to get, was at the crux of being beat. And Vaquer had a whole lot of offense on her. The same thing going with Echerio with MJF because Echicero, excuse me. So MJF, he gets cocky, starts off the match, and then Echicero gets a whole lot of offense in. And then you're like, oh, wait a minute, there's something going on here. And that was just another part where it was like, wow, man, there's, you know, MGF helping to go ahead and boost this guy up. They didn't give a whole lot to this match, but obviously MGF with the win over this and continue to take his laps on luchadors right now after he beat Roosh and now he beats up on Hedgesero and, you know, he's getting himself worked back up into the main event once again. So you're looking at the world title once again. That's good to see where he's supposed to be at after losing it, you know, partly because of Mojo, but also losing it from injuries, you know, sustained from the undisputed kingdom at world's end. The elite and Kazuchika Okada. That was fun. Max Caster with a very savage beating on the rap leading into the match, but the elite winning tonight, that was the right move and scissor ace. So Hiroshi Tanahashi joining the acclaimed, not too long to give them the match on this, but again, that was fine because it was honestly like, I couldn't believe they had time for the matches they had again, 15 matches on the card the entire night, not even talking about the zero hour, which had a lot of stuff interesting in there. <clears throat> so first of all, Kyle Fletcher, Aussie open over Serpentico. Then you had Kings, of the black throne. I missed this match. The four way tag team match with Tomohiro Ishii, and Kyle Riley, Roderick strong, a kid kid and private party. I missed that match, but Kings of the black throne, will win. Then will Nightingale and Tom Nakano, this is where I caught it, and Chris Statlander and Momo Watanabe. So Willow and Chris will face each other in the Owen, Hub, Owen Hart Club Tournament semifinals coming up. That's the next thing to set up, but that was just kind of like a little precursor to it. Mariah May, she comes out and takes on Soraya, 
eight minutes, 30 seconds in the first round match of the Owens Hart, Owen Hart Club tournament cup tournament again for them. And it's good to see Saran back there. I am kind of curious. They don't want to go and push her much more up the ladder into any other, you know, title pictures. They haven't done that with her much at all. So I'm just kind of curious about that. They haven't thought about putting her in that spot yet, but I'm wondering what what's going on with that. The outcast thing right now has been replenished. Now with Harley Cameron and Anna J. I like that. You know, that's a pretty nice entourage faction there for you. Just wondering what they're going to be doing going up next. Lucha Brothers, by the way, a show, a match that really, I would have loved to have seen this on the main card because it was damn good. 12 minutes for the Lucha Brothers and Mystico over Los Angeles de Japón, Yojo Tutsi, who, you know, you can tell he's kind of come from fresh to the dojo. He's working his way up. Big guy. Titan and Hiromo Takahashi, they're you know, kind of like behind the mix, you know, as goons for Tutsi and Naito, but still, the match was really good. Let's just put it like that. You know, seen quite a bit of Mystico as well, just to make, make the point as well, which has been cool. But, you know, more than anything else, it's it's good to go and see that. But again, the CMLL presence is definitely there tonight. And when I look at the rest of the matches, you know, the time was Tony Storm, Mina Shirakawa feud. That has been magical it was one of my one of the best things that happened through the whole setup because i think the whole triangle with mariah may it really made for some good stuff and the match is done thomas tony storm wins she retains the title and mariah may gets them to again come together i love all that that's really cool orange cassidy much more of a tougher position here not playing too much of the gimmick but giving a great match with Sat Saber Jr., no no doubt about that. And I look and I just say, you know, you had a good setup. The card was well set up. Moxie Naito, obviously, you could do a barn burn, but they've had a lot of matches with each other. Let's just say it like that, too. And Strickland Osprey, they've worked back before. That's all great. I enjoyed the pay per view at all. If my thing is, I look at all this and I say to myself, man, it is a long-term project in play for AEW to go ahead and work on this and bring these organizations and these factions together. And it's one of those things where it's indicative to show what distinguishes AEW from the rest of the pack. Now, MLW will do their work with other organizations. They've always done that with Pro Wrestling NOAA or the AAA or what have you. And the NWA a little bit to some extent, but now they're building their own territory system, right? That's the part I can enjoy is that and TNA, you know, their relationship right now with WWE is just an NXT only thing. Let's just be honest about this here. They didn't want to say it like that, but the relationship that TNA now has is with NXT. It's obvious that WWE doesn't want to go ahead and have anything tarnished with any of their stars from other organizations too much into the fold of their main roster because the WWE wants to keep it pretty much sacrosanct that's fine but then also don't try to play to the crowd and think that you're going to show that you're you know willing to show the best of the best to other organizations like no relationship is not going to happen it's like you know the same thing with ufc they would never work with you know bell tour they would never do that they wouldn't ever work with pride back in the day but the thing or maybe they did i don't remember but either which way that WWE wants to be standalone and that's the part where I need to make that distinguishing part here too, is that WWE should be more sports entertainment. And of course they can have their wrestling as part of what they have. But the other, the other thing that's going to be understood is that some of the stars that have moved over that chose WWE because of contracts. Look, you can go say you want, Oh, Tony conscious flashing money into all these people. Sure. He is. If he's got the money, he's going to pay it. But for some of these stars, especially some of these stars that decided to go on somewhere else. You know, the opportunity to go and work in other territories and work with other groups and just work with some of the stars they, they just admire from afar that they can never do in WWE, right? You think about with John Moxley or Brian Danielson or Mercedes Monet. Mercedes Monet right now is happy to go and work where she's at because she's also working in other organizations. 
And, you know, people can kind of like, don't look it down. Oh, you're going to work in Tijuana. You're going to work in, you know, Mexico or Japan. And nobody's going to watch you. Okay. But it doesn't matter for them. They want to begin to show their craft. They want to show they're the best in the world. And they want to work a lot of places. They actually follow the call of what the NWA was used to be. Because the NWA, you know, before WCW owned it, you know, NWA was actually like the territory and the way it was formed. WWE is just not that. And WWE doesn't need to be the territory system. See, what people don't understand is that, you know, Triple H has to understand this too. Okay, you don't need to worry about trying to pillage from other free agencies or, or other rosters. So, like, the idea of, oh, they should go after Okada when he was available, or Osprey, or, Mon- or, or you know, try to get Sasha Banks back. If they don't want to go, they don't want to go, right? For some of the stars that you have lost because they decided to go somewhere else and decided to go and just work their craft and do something more, Christian Cage, Edge, Brian Danielson, yeah, they're a little bit past their prime. You could say that, but they're still working, and they're still enjoying themselves. I'm sure Edge would have been elated to go work with somebody on these ro- one of these rosters here from Mexico or Japan. I think you would have loved that. But unfor- or Adam Copeland, but unfortunately he got hurt. But think of all these stars we have right here, you know, I mean, with Samoa Joe. And Jericho obviously loves to do all this stuff, right? And then you have the pillars that you're bringing in here too. If, you know, if Darby Allen was in hurry, he'd probably be in this too. But Jack Perry's all in it. Samoa Joe's all, I mean, Hook's all in this. MJF is all up in this. A lot of young stars still being included in all this right here, right? And it's nice to know that you have the camaraderie of the fact of all these stars working in other organizations. And you get to notice this, how well-rounded, how world-renowned they are. Like, I almost forget about the fact that Tony Storm was in stardom. And, like, you know, they, they, they tell the story. <clears throat> I mean, it gives me some world worldwide view on these stars. I like that about these stars. And WWE doesn't want to play that up. They don't want to do anything with that. You know, they want to bring up some of these stars that might have worked in Mexico and all, like, you know, or worked in Japan with Ricochet or Shinsuke Nakamura or Santos Escobar. Like, you don't want to talk about anything with all these guys and where they came from. It's like, it's WWE or nothing. And if you're going to do that, then you need to build homegrown talent. WWE should only rely on homegrown talent. They have, uh, Triple H has all the resources necessary. You got that million, multi-million dollar performance center next to line program. You can, you can craft and build athletes, you know, division one collegiate athletes. If they don't want to go into whatever sport they want to go into, they don't want to do anything else because their sport's done. That after they become an Olympian or an all American, they can be turned into a wrestler and you take that program and you build it up. You have all the means to do that. And some of the stars you bring up, you know, that might be nepotism. Okay. I'll, I'll be fine too. Cause you have that working for you. But for the most part, you keep it within the family. You don't need to go looking at every else because that's the part. That's why I think it's so important to distinguish the fact that with WWE, right? They have their own developmental territory. Okay, they have NXT and, you know, they've done a thing where they decided to go ahead and, you know, take the route of, all right, we'll take some of these other stars from other organizations and try to build them up and polish them off. And that worked for a while. But of course, we know that Vince didn't like those, so he would kind of like shoot them down. But then when we decided to go ahead and use stars within the, the, the talent pool as a different story. Because the ones that might have come into the fold from other organizations Keep this in mind, too, that, you know, they have to go ahead and go through rigorous work to be able to be then put into a level where they can be noticed and recognized. When you think about, you know, the work that Drew McIntyre worked, you know, when he was out of WWE and he was in TNA and he worked in other organizations, right? You think about AJ Styles and getting to work, you know, in other spots i don't you never get to work anywhere else but like you know and then cody going to work in japan or you know whatever it's like all this work that all these other stars want to have somewhere else they're not going to get recognized for that over here but that's the difference between professional wrestling and wwe because wwe is still synonymous with sports entertainment and whether you like it or not triple h you have to live with the fact that 
you're not going to change the stigma of sports entertainment. You cannot bury that. You cannot eliminate that. The stigma of sports entertainment. I'm going to talk about this more on Wednesday. You can't get rid of that. You cannot shake it. It's not going to happen. You will never get rid of sports entertainment. That is what WWE was built on. Vince built that. He never cared about this whole territory thing like everybody else. Instead, he had bigger aspirations. And to his credit, he said, I'm not going to do it with NWA. He don't work with NWA. I'm just going to buy them all out. And that's what he did. He wanted to make his own thing, his own playground. He didn't want to work with others. Created his own brand. Created his own stigma. Think of the stars we all think about that were the stars that made this company. You know, it's very rare if any of those stars, we really consider that they were big a deal in anywhere else. Like, you don't talk about Hulk Hogan working in Japan. How well he did in Japan for, a mat, uh, for that matter. Or he missed you in his work in, in Mexico. We never hear about that much. So AEW taking the mark and fostering relationships they have in Japan and Mexico. For whatever reason, a, a AAA right now is where they are. I don't know what's going on with that. But Triple H, I, 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 Triple A, Triple A, excuse me. Triple A, I don't know where they're going right now. I wish I did. But at the moment, I can't knock what AW is doing right here. It is taking a little bit of a dent on their normal day-to-day -day stuff. But now they're going to build up for Arthur Ashe. They're going to build up for, you know, full gear in November. And they got other shows coming up. So for them, you know, they're going to work on things. They got their own thing. They got Blood or Guts. Blood or Guts coming up as well. You know, there's a lot more to build things up, the special events, which is always cool for them. They got that coming up. And that'll get build more interest. They just got to build some more storylines. And just some of these stars they have right now need to just take off a bit more. And it's not like the, you know, it's not like the, the rock, like you don't have all these stars not working with being mentored with other stars, like, you know. Right now, you still got patriarchy, and you got to deal with Luchasaurus and Nick Wayne working with him, right? Or right now, Samoa Joe working with Hook, and Chris Jericho working with Big Bill and you know Brian Keith. Like you know, there's something there. Like at least you're you're seeing the the, the camaraderie and all this, right? But yeah, we just need some other, we need some more feuds. We need some more factionary kind of stuff to happen. That's, those are the kind of things we need to build, build up. And, you know, th if we can make it where the storylines that AEW does are not so much stop start, but a consistency to the, to more of them. Like, obviously they do have storylines they kind of work off of, but, you know, to the level that they'll have a storyline that will just really build up to a, a big crescendo, like, all the stuff that we had at Adam Cole and Undisputed Kingdom and all the stuff with Adam and GF and Adam Cole together, like that kind of stuff, the inner circle kind of stuff, you know, the stuff that, you know, with MJF had with the pinnacle, all these things, we could use a little more of the extra in depth, extra layers of storyline, layers of storytelling within. Okay. I think some of that would be really helpful now going forward. So I'd like to see some more of that. Anyway, we're going to leave it there. That's my recap for Forbidden Door. So you'll catch some clips over on social media. Of course, you'll find the website, kingofpodcasts.com, for all the content. And more importantly, remember, you can find the show on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, YouTube, YouTube Music, and, of course, find us on the YouTube channel, at King of Podcasts. So however you're going to find it, thank you for finding the show. Come back this Wednesday. And like I said, we're going to talk about the WWE right now. You know, that Triple H cannot shake the stigma of sports entertainment. We're going to talk about that on Wednesday. Come back for another Wrestling Is Real podcast because wrestling needs us.